Okay, good morning. Um, we will go ahead and get started with day one of the overview of the beginner training for redesign. And again, we're, this is going to be in reference to the core menu options today. Uh, we will try to take a break around 1015. I did set a little alarm on my phone just so I remember to stop because sometimes I get long winded and get going and I forget to give you a break. So we will go ahead and get started. And if anybody has questions during the time that I'm speaking or whatever, just go ahead and unmute yourself. Feel free to go ahead and ask the question at any time that's fine. As said, we're going to be going over the core menu option today. So uh, what we need to do is we need to go to that core tab at the top. And um, one thing I wanted to mention, I'll have you keep this in mind, um, depending on the roles, and we'll talk about roles not today, probably tomorrow or the next day, um, but depending on the roles that a user has, it, it will vary on what they can see on this screen. Now, my role for today, it always is an admin role, and you as an ITC probably have the same admin roles that I do, so we can pretty much see everything. But we have different roles that you can give to employees at the district that will allow them to see only certain tab options and certain fields, or you may be able to, uh, you know, give a, like a treasure. Maybe they want LV access. Well, maybe they want admin access. And we'll talk about that again tomorrow. But I wanted to make you aware of that, depending on what role and permissions they have. They may not see all these tabs that we have at the top. So just keep that in mind. <clears throat> okay, so the under the core option, you'll notice that we have several different subcategories. Um, all of these subcategories are basically out there for more or less for empl adding employee information or employer information. That's what the core menu is pretty much created for. Uh, we do have what we call mass change option. In several of the subcategories in core, we'll see that throughout the, uh, the training as we go into these different subcategories, you'll see that there's a mass change option available. And we'll talk about how to make that available and basically what that mass change option can accomplish if used. I'll go through how to add the mass change option to the different screens, we'll go through that right now. So in order to be able to use the, a mass chain, the mass chain option, under the system, mass chain uh, configuration, or excuse me, got the wrong place, the system modules, there is a mass chain option available. So if I go to system and go to modules, it will pull up it's going to show me all the all the modules that are available. You can see right now there is a minus sign next to this mass change service, meaning that they already I already have the mass change service turned on. If there's a plus button next to it, that means that that service is not turned on yet. So you can see I have several different modules already turned on. Mass change service is one of them. So I'm just going to turn this off so you can see actually what I'm doing. I turned it off. So now I'm going to go into one of the subcategories that I know mass change would be allowed in. So under the employee record, you can see there's a create option here. But if I go back to the modules, and if I turn that module on, meaning I click the plus button, now it's showing as a negative, you'll see I get a message saying the change will not take full effect until the page is refreshed. So I'm just gonna refresh the page. When I do that, I should be able to go back, let's go back here, maybe, to the, the core employee option. And now you'll see I have a mass change tab available to me that I can actually use to make some mass changes to the records. Again, we're not going to talk about that right now, but we will in a little bit. Um, 
A uh, user has has to have update access to to be able to be able to process the mass change option. So if they hold a group manager role, which most of your payroll employees have that role already assigned to them, they would be able to use that mass change tab. Also, the admin mass change feature or permission is something that can be granted to an individual employee through the roles that could be given to them and they would also have the capability of using that mass change feature as well. Another thing we're going to talk about a little bit are template records. Um, I want to talk about templates. If you're familiar with classic at all, perfect example is your deductions. We have template records that a lot of districts or ITC create using an all ones employee. And then they just go in and create what, what we call template records. So those template records basically show certain fields that need to be populated for that particular deduction. So let's just say you have a city deduction. Maybe it's, let's say Toledo taxes. Well, pretty much for every employee, the rate is always going to be 1.75 or whatever the Toledo rate is. So you could create a template record with that 1.75 already defined. And then when you're adding new employees, if a new employee uh, is subject to Toledo taxes, you could use that template record and actually create that record with the, the rate already defined for that employee. So you don't have to put in a lot of the fields that may be already repetitive, well, they, they will already be out there and created. So I'm gonna just go in and show you really quickly how to create a template record. Um, let's just use the payroll items. That's a, like I said, that's a really good one to, to uh, use. So I'm gonna go into create. Let me get this over here. This is in my way. <laughs> all right, so I'm gonna go ahead, I'm just gonna go ahead and create a new annuity record, all right? Um, let's just do, now, the thing about creating a template record, if you already have an all ones record, you could use that employee ID to create the template. If you were adding a new employee, to the, you know, to the payroll items. And let's just say you already had templates set up for federal, state, you know, city, maybe some annuities, but maybe this employee has an annuity that you don't already have out there. You could go in and create a template record using that employee, but then you could also create the record for the employee. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull up an employee that I know is in here. Um, let's just see. Let's do that. I don't know if I have. Nope. Here we go. No, I don't want to use that one. Um, there we go. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and click continue. Say this is an employee that already exists, but I also want to create a template record for that 600 record. I could go in and define, you know, maybe it's a percentage. Maybe they pay 1%. We have to define the pay cycle. If there were certain account numbers, et cetera, you could define that. But once I've done all of the, the basically record or the field that I would want included on a new rec template record, I could, click the save as template option. And when I do that, it asks me to save it as a, give it a name. So I'm gonna call it 600 test. So I'm gonna click save. When I save it, if it saves, there we go. It'll, you'll see it's going to be up here. Those are where you can find all the different options for the templates that you create. But like I said, because I use an employee that's already out there, or maybe I use a new employee to create the template, all the data is already there for that employee. All I have to do 
is click the save option. And then I save his record as well as I created a template record from here out that can be used for other employees when I'm adding new employees for that particular payroll item. So that's a really nice feature that we have with the templates. All right, so let's go back to the core. We're gonna start at the beginning. Uh, we have the ACH destination option. What this screen is, is um, used for like your routing numbers for your employees' uh, direct deposits, as well as a description. So obviously when you're importing the data for your new, your wave seven or wave eight districts that are going to be coming on, if they have a routing number already defined out in the 700 record in classic in the direct deposit record those routing numbers will pull over into this uh, ach uh, destination record now if you have x rav or route, route screen excuse me route screen set up already with routing numbers and descriptions so maybe like the routing number in Fifth Third Bank, the routing number in Huntington Bank, the routing number in you know, State Bank. All of that information will import in when you do the import. If you do not, if your district does not use the route screen and they don't have that XWAP information that ties that routing information to the direct deposit 700 records, then all that will pull in are the routing numbers themselves. And the district at that point could go in and modify and add the description if they so choose, it's strictly up to them how they wanna do that. But to create routing numbers, say that a district, you imported the data and you need to add a new routing number, you could just use the create option. You could use the create option. And all you would do is enter in a, the new routing number of the new bank that you're trying to add for that employee and the description of that bank and then that, save it. Once you save it, that information will then be included in your ACH destination. And one thing that you will see, there is a mass change tab here, but the mass change feature is not available for this option. Um, we have the tab. The tab is kind of located in several different screens, but because of the way it's all set up, sometimes you'll see the mass change tab, but it's not available to use in this, in this screen. I think, I, I've been double check on that because it never used to be, but maybe I'll double check and make sure, but as of the last time I knew, it was not available to use in the ACH destination record. The next option under the core is the ACH source option. The ACH source option, if you're familiar with classic, is kind of like the dirt maintenance screen. And what that is used for, it creates informational record um, for the district who submit um, ACH uh, direct deposits to, to the banks. It can also be used uh, for HSA as well. So uh, the records are created and set up so that, that the district can create a tape that they can send to the bank or the Federal Reserve, wherever they send their, their direct deposit or their HSA information. Um, the bank is basically, if your district does not already have this set up, which they probably do in classic at this point. They probably already have a setup, but in case they were switching banks or something, um, you would have to set up a new ACH source record for that, uh, for that new bank. Um, another thing to keep in mind that we always tell the district, say that you are adding information, it is critical that they work with the bank in order to get um, the record set up correctly. And I'll go ahead and pull up the Hey AC transfer record. And you can see on here, it looks very similar to the Durbank screening classic. And you just want to make sure that they work with the bank, that they get this set up how the bank wants it to be set up for them to get their file. 
in the to be included in the file. And any of the information that is on this screen is on this record. As far as like what needs to be populated, all that information can be found in our documentation at any time under the ACH source information. And the same thing holds true when you're setting one up for health savings accounts as well. Be the same thing. You'd have to set up a, a ACH source record or your health savings account if you're going to be doing it electronically. A lot of districts still don't do electronic submission of the HSA. They still process a check. And so if that's the case, they, would, they wouldn't be using this. But if they plan on using or creating a tape file for their HSA, they have to make sure that they have this set up. One thing I wanted to kind of tell you about as well is most of you are probably already familiar with this, but I just want to make sure that if there's any new users, any of the screens that we go to, you're going to pretty much see these uh, options. We have, a, it looks like an I, which is a view option. And if you hover over it, you can see it says view. We have like a paper and pen, which is an edit option. You hover over that, you can see it's edit. And the X is a delete option. Now, anything that you delete normally, um, whether it be employee record, position, compensation, they're never truly deleted. They're, all, they're what we call archived. And archive basically means they're concealed, so you can't, you don't see them. So if a user says, well, I deleted that record, they may feel like they deleted it, but in, in reality, it's still out there. It's just behind the scenes, they don't see it on the screen because it's archived. The next option we have under core is adjustments. And adjustments can be used for a variety of things. Um, uh, the main thing that adjustments is probably used for is payroll item adjustments. Uh, in class, like, you used to be able to go into the deduction screen itself and update uh, the field, the, like the cum fields at the bottom of the record, maybe like the total gross, taxable gross, amount withheld, things like that. Well, in redesign, you cannot do that. You cannot go to the payroll item screen itself and make the change. Any changes that are to be made to payroll items, whether it be to the total gross, taxable gross, withholding, et cetera, all need to be made on the adjustment screen. So in order to be able to create an adjustment, we click the create option. And when we do that, you can see here, um, there's a feature called create new or close what that feature is used for, and if you see that on any of the uh, other screens, what that means is if I click the create new, once I go in and create a record for this employee I'm going to make an adjustment for, the screen is, is going to basically clear so I can add another adjustment. So I'm gonna go ahead and choose my employee. I'm gonna pick on Hernandez again. Maybe, here we go. And then if I'm, if I'm doing a payroll item, I would have to choose which payroll item I'm making the adjustment to. Let's just say it's the 500 record. And then it's going to ask me what type of adjustment I'm making. Maybe I need to make an adjustment to the amount withheld. I have to make sure that I enter in a transaction date. Now the transaction date has to be within the posting period that I'm in. To see which posting period you are currently in, if you look in the right-hand corner, upper right, you'll see I'm in February of 2021. So I'm gonna just do something. I'm gonna try adding a March date. And then I'm gonna go in and add, this may work. Um, I need to 
add a hundred dollars to the amount withheld. And then if I want to, I could type in a description. We I also have the capability of going in and choosing which today fields I want to adjust on that record. If I only wanted to do year to date, I could just uncheck the all the other options and just you whoops. I got to check the right one and just have the year to date checked. When I do that, I click save. Now, you'll notice I got an error. The error is telling me that the posting period that I, basically the transaction date that I entered, the posting period doesn't exist because I'm in February posting period, I'm required to use the February date. So if I go back down here and change this, I'm sorry, that is my dog. She's drinking ice, <laughs> if you hear that in the background. So I'm changing that to 2.9. And then I'm going to go ahead and try to click the save option again. Now you'll see that the record was created. But you'll notice, since I had that create new tab checked, Hernandez record is still there. And it allows me because it cleared the type, the date, the amount of the description. I could go in and create another record, another adjustment record for him. Maybe for the total gross. So I could do the same thing. Now, if I chose that close option, if I chose that close option, what would have happened is after I created that record that I just added, it would have just basically it would have just basically not not created the next the record for me that was sitting out there. Um, in adjustments, you'll also notice that you have the capability of adjusting uh, ODJFS weeks. We'll go down here a little bit. The ODJFS total gross retirement days and hours for SARS and STRS, as well as EMIS attendance and EMIS absence days. And those are basically used a lot of times for um, community schools. Maybe you have a community school that does not process payroll at all, but they still have to report to EMIS. So they have records in payroll and they have to have attendance entries entered this is where they would go to enter that information as far as for attendance information. And you have to use the adjustment screen and you and enter in the EMIS attendance records in order for that information to pull into EMIS properly. You can see there's several different options out here. And the ones at the beginning, like your health insurance, moving expenses, your taxable benefits, fringe benefits, life insurance, adoption assistance, dependent care, third-party paid vehicle lease, all of those, if you think about it, and again, if you're familiar with Classic, all of those are basically like what is in the one deduction screen record, um, usually used at the end of the year when doing W-2 information. So that's what all those adjustments would be used for most of the time. I'm sorry, my dog is deciding that she wants to join in, I guess. Okay, so the next thing that we're gonna talk about is attendance. Uh, there's a couple different ways of using the attendance screen. We have, let me go into the attendance record. <clears throat> Sorry, it's a little slow this morning. Okay, we have a create option as well as a mass add option. And with both of those options, the post to current or post to future choices are available. So I'm going to show you uh, both of them and how they work. So first of all, we'll go to the create option, which is more or less like you're just creating one record at a time but you will notice that we do have a posting option. Right now it's set to no posting the payroll, but if I click that down arrow, I could choose the post current or post future. Most of the time district use the future option. 
you don't have to, but most of the time they do. So I'm going to use that option. And then what I'm going to do is add a, an attendance for an employee. So I will go ahead and find my employee. And anytime you're trying to enter an employee in, you if you know the ID, you could put that in or any occurrence of the first or last name. So if I, I put in HR for her name, this, but I know the name is Harry. So if I do H-A-R-R, -R, it pulls up all the occurrences of H-A-R-R, -R, whether it be last name, first name, doesn't matter. And then I can choose my employee from those options. Then it, I will have to choose which position I'm adding this record for. It defaults it to the very first record, which is this teacher record. I'm gonna go ahead, in the activity date, you can either type in a date, if you wanted manually, or you can choose a date from this calendar. I'm just going to go ahead and choose a weekend date. And the length of the of the attendance is one for that for this entry. And that obviously your transaction type, whether it be absence or attendance. And then you'll notice when I chose a transaction type attendance automatically put in the category but now if you have substitutes and you have a district that uses substituting and they they enter in the uh teacher they substituted for they could use the substituting option and then over here we have a substitute for and they could actually go in and type in again find the employee gri maybe it was bill grimes well maybe work okay there it is i could then choose grimes that he substituted for grimes the the appointment type and pay date do not need to be populated because that should be taken care of when you save the record and when you actually process the payroll there is a subcategory feature that's just like classic um it's not anything defined within the system. The district can put in whatever they want. So like maybe if they did like jury duty or maybe they were substituted because of COVID, you know, they could put COVID in there. CO for COVID. And then when I go in, I could go in, I could copy this row for this employee. Maybe I wanted to add Saturday too. I could do a copy row. And when I copy the row, all the data in this row will copy down and then all I would have to change would be the date. Sorry, my system, I don't know, it's my internet. There we go. I could just go in, of course it added two. I'm just gonna go in and change the date to the 20th. This one here, I don't want. So you'll notice there's an X option, delete option. I could just delete that entry. Okay, or let's say, you know, the Hernandez, he subbed two days, but then I also had somebody else's sub. I could go in and do this plus button, which will add a new record. And all I have to do is then find my new, my next employee. Uh, let's do, uh, let's see here. Do we have anybody with an AJ? If I do or not. Maybe, uh, let's see. And then choose a position and then date. Whether there's an absence or attendance, we'll do that. I'm hoping this guy uh, qualifies. <laughs> and then what I can do when I click the save option, these employees records for future are going to show up since I told it, I wanted to go to future. All of those records should show up for me. And when they do, I'm going to have the capability of going in and making changes. So maybe I want to go in here and change the pay type to a miscellaneous. I can do that. Or maybe I want to change the description. I can do that. Maybe I want to change the units. Maybe he worked three units. Or I want to change the rate. I can change that, whether it's supplemental or not. 
I can change that. The supplemental tax option, if I chose to that, I could change that as well. Uh, is it subject to retirement? Yes or no, I can change that. I could change the retire hours. If I didn't want this actually to go on the next payroll, I could put in an effective date, meaning a date within the period beginning and ending date of the next payroll. I also have the capability of going in and changing the account if I wanted to. I could change the employer distribution flag if I wanted to. Once I got all the changes made, you'll see, you'll notice anything that I can change is not grayed out. So all the fields that are not grayed out, I can make changes to. Now, if I change this to miss, then you'll notice like these other options become available. When this was reg, you'll notice I didn't have a capability or an option to go in and make changes to the retirement or to the supplemental or the account information. Those are all grayed out, but you will see anything that's not grayed out, you have a capability of making changes to. When you've made all the changes, you could actually then go in and post those records to future. And it tells you that three records were posted to future. So now if we go out and if we look in future, we should see those three records sitting out there. Hernandez, it grinds, and I did. Actually, I had done another one for Hernandez, so that's why that one is sitting out there. So in reality, all three of those records that I had added attendance are now out in the future. And again, that was the, the create option. We also have the capability of using a mass a mass add option. Let me get that pulled up here. Sorry, it's a little slow. I think it's my internet. It must be when I get so many things going. Oops, hold on. I have to let somebody in here. You just logged in. Okay, here is the mass add option that I was talking about in attendance. So you could use the mass add option. And basically what you could do is this is would be like one employee at a time, but you notice we do have the posting mode option. So I could post a future or current if I wanted to. I could add my employee. So I'll pick on Hernandez again. Oops. Uh, yeah, Hernandez. And it's still for job one. And that will default, or I could pick a different job if I needed to. They should show up in the drop down. The length, the absence type, the unit. It could, I could, if it's, it's pulling basically from the leaves record. And then again, the appointment type, the pay date, the substituting for, and you could use that option again if you wanted to, just like we did in the create option. And this time we'll go ahead and we'll use another day because I already used. And you'll notice we have a feature to include weekend days. I want to include weekend days because he's already had a calendar with work days. So I just want to give him some weekend days. I will use the 14th because I already used the 20th and 21st. If I try that again, I would get an error telling you that those days are already out there and I cannot have more than one day added for that. So I'll choose the 13th and the 14th. I'm going to post the future and I hit create. Now you'll notice there's a, cl a clear all dates option. So maybe you went in and marked a bunch of dates and they're wrong. You could just hit that. It'll clear them all out and you can go back in and add the dates again. So right now I've got my Saturday and Sunday. The two dates are selected. I'm going to click the create option. When I do that, that future record, what it's going to go over to future is there. So again, I have the capability of going in and changing the pay type if I wanted to. When I change that, several other fields now become modifiable. So I could change the rate, the retirement code, the account if I wanted to, 
description, uh, whether it's supplemental or not, how many units, um, the supplemental taxing, taxing option if I wanted to. But again, notice if I have it set as a reg, like it was initially set as, the supplemental option, the account, the retirement, all those features, all those options, I cannot change. But in reality, if he is a, a not a struck paid employee with a calendar, I'm probably not going to want to use regular for sure. I would be using miscellaneous because if you use regular, that's going to go towards the contract that's created for that employee, which we don't want to do because this is extra time that he worked. So it should be defined as miscellaneous. Then I could go in and make changes to accounts, all that information. Once I've got everything uh, set up how I want it, I can go ahead and click the post a future option. And when I do that, again, that record should be sitting out in future and I also added the attendance information as well. So if I go back, I'll go ahead and get rid of this. If I wanted to, you know, if there's not a, the next employee, I can go in, find that employee, add them, add days, post a future. You could do that or you could use that create option, or we have a third option, which would be the, uh, the under utility is called attendance absence import. And what that is, it's just like USP import in classic. You have to have a CSV file created with the correct columns defined on that spread on that CSV file, because even though Maybe you're not going to um, post the future. You have to have specific, blah, specific columns uh, added on that spreadsheet in order for it, this program to work correctly. Because um, what we call those blank fields are they're like a, a space, you know, like a, I don't know, what, I'm trying to think of the name of them. They're like Space, you have to have the record there, even though you might not have anything in it, you still have to have the data in there. And if you need to know like what or how you have to have that set up, we have a spec, uh, spec file uh, document out there. I think we have it out in our documentation. If we don't, I'm pretty sure we do. If you don't, uh, send me a message, I'll go ahead and send it to you. I've got that information. Um, actually, let me just pull it up, that way you can see exactly what I'm talking about. Let's see if I can find it here. Yeah, right here. All right, so this is what it looks like. Placeholder, that's the word I was trying to think of. So even though maybe, let's just say that you're not using the subcategory for SSN option for column L, that L still has to be there. Even though it's, it might be blank, that column still, that still needs to be there. Because a lot of times districts use, maybe they go from column I and then they don't use anything until column P or column Q or maybe U. Well, you can't just go um, I, J, then go down and pull the, pull the pay type in as L, then pull the attendance in as U. It will not work. You will error out. It will not work. Even though you're not using column, you have to have it there for a placeholder. So just keep that in mind. So what the district could do is, would be to find their file. If they use the, 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 I can't talk, the location code, on their CSV file, they would have to define whether it's building IRN or the building department code. A lot of districts don't use that, so they just leave that as none. Uh, if they want to post a future or current, they could actually choose, they wanna post a future or current. If they're not gonna do any posting, they would just choose the none option. If they wanna combine the attendance entries, maybe you have an employee on the spreadsheet that has seven different records for seven different days, they could combine the attendance entries all into one. And then does the district want to allow negative leave balances? If they did, they would check these boxes. Combine attendance entries, allow negative leave balances. 
And then the payroll account to charge from the drop down. there's two different options. Define payroll account for position. So whatever payroll account is set up or defined for that position will be used. Um, if you want to use the uh, sub for SSN, say that you have a bunch of substitutes that you're loading and you have the sub for SSN, like the teacher that they sub for defined on the attendance record or in your spreadsheet, you could use the sub for SSN and whatever pay account is defined for that particular employee will be the account that is used for the pay. Any questions on that? I know it's a little confusing. <laughs> okay, um, let me go through here. I gotta kind of go through what I've gone through. All right, our next option under core is the bank account. And the bank account is pretty much the district's bank account information. So um, maybe they have, maybe they have a couple different accounts. Maybe they have one account for payroll checks, another one for direct deposits. I mean, that's a stretch, but that's just an example. What they could do is they would have to go out and create two different bank account records because when they're processing the payroll and they go in and process either the checks or the direct deposits, it asks them for the bank account that they're going to be charging for. And those bank accounts actually may have different numbers uh, uh, set up for them as well, as far as like check numbers and payment numbers. So in order to create a bank account, they would just go into core bank accounts. And then since I already have, let me, let me just use this one. I have bank account one, I already have one set up, okay? I'm gonna go in and create a bank account two. And then description would be bank two. And I could put in the start and stop date if I wanted to, but I don't have to. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm just gonna save that record. And then later on, we will see where you come into play. But right now I have two different bank accounts set up for the district. Again, these are the district. Hey, Lori. Yes. Yes, somebody have a question? Um, oh, hold on. When well, we were migrating, yeah, I do. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Okay, sorry. When we were migrating um, districts on for a while, you had to edit that bank account or else auto rec wouldn't work. Is that the same or has that been fixed? Well, the bank account, the bank account is not in classic at all. There is no bank account information. So you have to add a bank account information in. There is nothing in the bank account. I mean, oh, in, I, cla in classic, there is no district bank account information. Right, so, but what I was saying is this, when you were using the bank file and trying to reconcile, it wouldn't see classic checks unless you had unless you edited this, or was that a new SAS? Which one is it? Uh, it could have been here, but I'm almost betting it was new SAS, but um, if you're trying to reconcile <laughs> check, if you were trying to, to reconcile checks that were processed in classic, it may have been in here, Bonnie. It may have definitely been in here. But okay. um, did, was there a bank account already defined? Yeah, they, they created a new one instead of editing the one that was in there. And because they created a new one, mm -hmm. the system didn't recognize it when they were doing the auto rec. Correct. Yeah, they probably would have had to have edited the one that they had out there. If, I'm, my guess is, was there probably a default bank account created when you did the import? And then they went in and added a new Oh, yeah, one. always. Yeah, yeah. So that, that would be my guess. They Like, really, there would never be a bank account too, unless a district truly has two different bank accounts. And uh, the classic, like everything that process you were trying to reconcile would have all been tied to that default bank account record that they had out there. So they should not have created a new one. They should have just edited the one that was already out there. Make sense? Yeah, I muted myself, sorry, thank 
I was like, where did she go? <laughs> Yeah, so in reality, Bonnie, they really do not have to create a new bank account unless they have more than one bank account for the district that they're using in payroll. I mean, if they don't, then they could just go in and and pretty much they could just edit this to, to put the bank name that they use instead of default bank account, they could use, you know, Fifth Third or Huntington or whatever bank they're using. They could just put that information in. But they should have, and I, I can understand what you're saying that they were getting an error because it was trying, to, it was probably looking at the new bank account that they added, not at the default bank account. That's my guess. Does that make sense? Does that help? Yeah, it does. Thank okay. you. Okay. Um, the next option we're going to talk about in core is the compensation. And the compensation in redesign is similar to classic. Again, if you're familiar with classic, it's about half of the job grading classic. So what that basically means is uh, I has a lot of the information from the second screen of job screen as far as like the pay information, the job title, that information, that's all included in the compensation record. And you'll see here that we have three different tabs for mm -hmm. compensation. We have all compensations, we have a contract compensations, which normally are your stretch paid employees or your you know, hourly employees that work your out like your custodians, et cetera. And then you have your non-contract compensations, which are, or could be um, supplementals, um, substitutes, things like that. Those would be non-contract non compensations. So if you have an employee, a brand new employee, a compensation is going to have to be added. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you what a contract compensation record would look like. So let's just I'm Hernandez. Let's just say Hernandez is new, even though Hernandez isn't new, but we'll say he is. And I already created a position record. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But I have to choose which position I'm creating this compensation record for. Well, again, what the pay information for the job is going to be. Um, why is it so it does not contract? Uh. You know, well, let me try something else. I've got, I think I have myself in here. Really? Really? No. No. Okay. Let me try adding myself. I think I have myself in here as a new employee. We'll find out real quick. They update these databases frequently. I don't have a position record. So. Um, let's try. Let's try this. Hmm. It's not letting me choose. Oh, I know why. Jeez. Oh my gosh. I was in the non-contract tab. See, right there's a problem. Okay, let's try this now. Let's go back. Here we go. If I was in the all compensation, it would give me the capability of choose, to choose. So I went back to all compensation. I'm going to go ahead and put Hernandez in. Maybe I can type. I must still be, yeah, I must still be set on the contract compensation, but you can see my compensation type is contract. So I'm gonna go ahead and do the continue option. When I do, these are all of the fields that are related to a compensation record. 
Now you'll notice the job calendar, because he already has a job calendar defined on, on the other job, it pulls in automatically. But I have the capability of changing that if I wanted to, if, at this time, if I need to. A description can be added. Now the description uh, can, is really helpful, like a lot of times when you're doing a sort on the compensations, maybe you want everybody that has a 20, 21, 22 compensation record. I could do 21, 22 teacher. That way I'd be able to filter that when I'm going in, maybe I want to report for everybody that has a 21, 22 teacher compensation record. And then the label can be used. It doesn't have to be used, but what the label is used for is when you're pulling, let's say you're going into future and you want to add a, a time slip information for him for some reason. If you have anything in the label, that will pull into the compensation area on the future record. So I'm just going to put future test. So later on when we do that, you'll be able to see what I'm talking about. Uh, we, ha we have to put in a compensation start and a compensation stop date. This is something that is different from classic. Um, in classic, we always used to say on the job screen, make sure you have a uh, start date. Stop date was not a big deal because the way the classic worked, it didn't really need the stop date. But redesign need that stop date because if the calendar that, that this employee is set up with has work days on it, it will actually Count, it'll have to give you the number of work days and put those on the compensation record, as well as calculate out the paper period, the unit amount, et cetera, based on the compensation start and the compensation stop date. And I'm gonna put seven, one, Then you have to make sure you notice that these fields are outlined in red. That means they are required. They have to be populated in order to create the record. So I'm going to go ahead and from the drop down, I'll just choose the pay plan and the pay unit. We have the unit amount. If I wanted to go in and put in a unit amount that I want him to be paid no matter what. Oops, I want that much. I could go in and put that amount in. If I click this override unit amount calculation, it will always use $125 for the unit amount. If I left that override unit amount empty, then the system would calculate what the unit amount would be. So in reality, sometimes when you let the system calculate it, it does a, a better calculation each pay. So it, uh, when the employee pulls into the payroll, they may be a few cents here or there different because of the way the system calculates that, that unit amount and that paper period. I could put in with retirement hours. Yes, here is advanced only gets marked when, they're, when you're actually put into the advance, which we always talk about at the fiscal year end meetings. Um, whether this compensation is a supplemental we could use a supplemental taxing option here if we wanted to apply annuities to supplemental or apply annuities to regular. This is not a supplemental, but we're just gonna leave it as none. There's an archived option. Basically, what I talk about archive pretty much means concealing the record. Since this is a new employee or a new compensation, we're obviously not wanting to archive the record. We're gonna leave it live. Uh, the contract dates worked will populate during the payroll, each payroll, it will add the days that were in that particular pay period. Pay period. The contract work days should populate from the calendar. Again, I'm not sure with these records, with these records, what we have in this ACM television, if we have work days listed or not. Uh, hours in the day, we can po populate that. Is this his primary compensation record? If it is, we could mark that field, basically meaning this is his primary job, but then he also has other supplemental jobs, because this is the primary compensation. 
The district doesn't have to mark this, but they can mark it if they so choose. Then we have the paper period option. And the paper period, again, should be calculated based on what we have in here for start stop days, if we have it set up for stretch, based on the number of work days. It, it, the system could calculate that automatically. Or if the district knows a certain paper period that they want the employee to be paid each pay, they could put that in here. And then if they did that, they could click that override paper period calculations box. And then that paper period would be, would be paid every payroll, no matter what. So then we have to put in <clears throat> the contract amount. How much is this employee going to be paid for this contract? And then the contract obligation. Uh, the contract type, again, is a, a user-defined a district field they could put in anything they wanted to, maybe a continuing contract, one year contract, they could put in whatever they want to. You do have to populate how many pays are in the contract. So let's just say he's got 26 pays. Actually, we'll say 19. That's his mark. Maybe less than that, 15. Um, if he had a, if if this was an existing record and we were doing a retro pay or maybe we wanted to do a retro pay we could actually enter the amount in here of the retro if he's a stretch paid employee we can mark the stretch pay field these compensation amounts will all get populated when the employee is paid each time we do have a salary schedule uh section we do not support the salary schedule program any longer. That's in classic. But if the district wants to keep track of like what salary uh, schedule column, the ID, and the step that they're on, they can do that using those fields. And they could run a report for that as well. Uh, another thing that they got to make sure of is this uh, compensation reportable to EMIS. If it is, they got to make sure that they check the reportable to EMIS option. You'll notice the local contract code is great. They, they can't under anything in that field. The calendar start date is important because basically that is what is used when we're counting retirement days and ODJFS days and weeks, or I should say weeks. So I'm going to go ahead and put in the calendar start date. Uh, the, the calendar stop date really don't need anything in that field until the employee truly leaves or this contract is you know terminated or whatever we could put a date in and in in reality you don't really have to put a calendar stop date in because if you stop paying them obviously they're not going to get any days anyway um this contract change extension type a contract change extension source all get populated when you actually use new contract and you activate new contracts it will tell you what uh, the old contract information was. Oops. Ugh. And then once I've entered all this information, we're going to see if if this calendar truly has work days on it. I'm going to go ahead and click the save option. If it does, it should calculate a paper period. And it did. Okay, so as you can see, my $125 unit amount was left because I defined, I said, override that field. I do not want to change that. But it did put in his paper period as $3,000. So at this point, a compensation has been added for this employee for $3,000 per, per paper, uh, paper period. And then if we wanted to add a non-contract compensation, somebody have a question, I'm sorry. Yes, this yeah, is Brenda. Um, on the contract, the calendar stop start date. Yes. Is that just for this contract? Yes. Um, for this year? Actually, or yeah, like if you were like, are you talking, like for a brand new employee, is that what you're talking about, Brenda? 
Because if you're creating a compensation record for a brand new employee, you're going to put it in the calendar start date of when they're starting. Now, when you're when you're using new contract, it's it's actually going to probably pull that old calendar start date just like it did in classic, unless you change it. Okay. But that that date will just kind of continue on forever and ever until you know they leave or whatever. But yeah. It would only, only the only time you're going to have to add a calendar start date would be if you're adding a new compensation for a new employee. But as far as like new contracts, okay. if you're using the new contract feature and activating, that should pull in the calendar start date that is already on the old compensation record. It'll just pull it from there to the new compensation record. So you don't have to worry about that being populated unless, like I said, they want to change it for some reason which they really don't have to because the system is just like oh. classic. It recognizes fiscal years and calendar years. So it understands, you know, how to calculate uh, fiscal years show for retirement purposes and things like that. So does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah. Does that help, Brenda? Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Um, we wanted to add a non-contract compensation. I'm just going to go back to all compensations and then I'm going to click create. When I do that, I should get the drop down, which will allow me, which it did, to actually go in and choose which compensation I want. Before I was on contract compensation, that's why only contract compensation was appearing under the compensation type. So let's just say I'm going to go in and add a record for Hernandez for a supplemental. Um, let's choose, let's choose this one. I'm just going to do a non-contract. You'll notice the difference in your non-contract records in comparison to the contract compensations. Again, you could put in a description. Oops. I could type. You want to put in a label. Do that. A start date. Stop date. Again, the start and stop dates are basically for calculation purposes. With this one here, since it's a nine contract. I not necessarily do not need a compensation stop date because I could use this, you know, this year or next year, whatever, if I wanted to. And then I would go and pull, do my pay plan and my pay unit. And I'm going to put in my pay unit, I'll put in one retirement hour, and then. And you'll notice here, I have the unit amount. Basically, if you have like substitutes or things like that, pretty much that's going to pull in as their hourly rate, $100. And then again, I want to put in a calendar start date because it's a new employee or a new compensation. And one thing I didn't point out is the pay group is defined on the bottom of the record. So you can see what pay group they're in and the pay group description. Is this reportable to EMIS? That's the supplemental we're gonna say it is. And I'm gonna go ahead and just click the save option. So that's how I create a non-contract compensation record for a new employee. Uh, one thing I wanna tell you because I catch myself all the time doing this Let's just say I'm in the compensation, contract compensations tab, okay? Because there are different fields available in the different tabs, the more option, the filtering option, has different choices. It has different options that you can choose to filter on. So again, I'm in contract compensations. Let's just say that I go, I want the unit amount to appear on the grid as well. I choose that option, unit amount. I hit the X button. When I do that, what happens is 
it refreshes, but you'll notice when it refreshes the screen, watch, it's coming. I'm gonna show you what I'm talking about because I catch myself constantly doing this. I'm so sorry this is slow like this. Okay, so I wanted the pay unit, remember? I figured that would be at the end. It's not there. Why is it not there? Because I am in all compensations. It reverts back to all compensations when it refreshes. So I have to go back to contract compensations in order to see those choices that I have on the grid. So let me kind of go over here and right here it is. That's the unit amount. That's what I was looking for. Now, when I say grid, that's basically this screen right here. This is my grid. I can have as many things as I want on here, or I can have not as many. So maybe I don't care about the type. I don't care about the position description. Maybe I don't, maybe I want the first and last name, obviously. But whatever I have on this grid, let me go back here. Let's do overwrite days work. No, I don't want days work. Let's do contract work days, hours in the day, uh, and the pay plan and the pay. Oh, I'm clicking too fast. Okay. So these are all my choices for my grid. This is what I want showing on my screen when I go to contract compensations. Okay. So again, it's going to refresh, it's going to take me back to all compensations again, which once I get back in contract compensations, I want to show you something else really cool. Okay, so contract compensations. Okay, so I can filter on this grid if I want for a particular employee, if I wanted to. Okay, let's just say I wanted to filter all the 21-22 teacher, 21-22 records. I could go in and enter a description 21-22. I believe it should pull. If it doesn't, I may have to use a what it did, okay. So if I had all kinds of records sitting on here with 21-22 listed, it would give me everything that has that 21-22 defined. If I narrowed it down even further saying teacher, it would only give me the 21-22 teacher records. Then I could actually go in to where it says report. I could click that option. And when I do, it allows me to uh, create a report of all the grid choices that I chose. So whatever is on my grid is going to be on my report. So I'm going to choose my format, which we have several format options. We have PDF, CSV, tab, uh, tab separated, Excel, uh, Excel data. We have another one called Excel field names, which is used a lot of times when you're trying to maybe create a report that you're going to use to load back into the system. I'll just use that for right now. I'm gonna go ahead and click the generate. Now, if I wanted to save this report for some reason, maybe I like all the, all the choices I have on this grid, I could save this report. I could call it Lori's report and click the save report option. And it's going to tell me it saved the report as Lori's report. Okay. Now I'm going to exit out of that. I want to generate this report. So I'm going to go ahead and click this generate report button. When I do that, it should create a report for me with all those grid choices that I have set on there. And again, because I filtered, it's only going to give me the data. And oops, hold on. Where'd you go? There you are. Hold on, I gotta pull it over. It went to my other screen. 
Here we go. So here, these are all of my, uh, my options that are on my grid, everything that I have there that I wanted to pull into a report. So I've got all this information pulled in into my report. It's a very nice feature. And then if I go, I think it's gonna be out here. If I go to reports, remember how I saved that report? I could go here to Lori's report, and I could create that report again using this download report option, generating download report option. So it's kind of cool if you are able to create a report from the grid that you really like, you could actually save it and then you could regenerate those reports because you've saved it out into the reports option menu. So that's a really nice feature that we have. Are there any questions on compensations? I know it's it's kind of a <laughs> kind of crazy, but I think what we're going to do is take about a five minute break. And then I'll come back and we're going to go over the next option, which is day codes. So we'll go ahead and take five minutes. We'll meet back here about 1019. Let's say 1020. <laughs> we'll give you six minutes and um, then we'll start back up again. Okay, we're back. Welcome back, everyone. Um, I guess we're going to go ahead and go back to the core option. And we're going to go into the day codes field. Now, the day codes can basically be used for um, dates that the district wants to define for, for employees like fingerprinting, um, background check, things like that. And what they could do is they, they create a custom field or there's like a field called date that they can actually put different custom date code fields in and then they could put the dates in and then they could run reports on those dates based on what is uh, populated in those fields. So I'm gonna show you how to actually create a date code so if we went into core day codes and we click the create option, you could uh, give it a display name. So let's do background check. And it already has the group defined where it's going to go. So it's going to the employee date custom field, which is a field, a section that is on the employee record. If I wanted to put it in the job screen, I could do that as well. But usually they're already they're defined mostly on the employee record. That's usually where the date codes are, are put. And then the property name, we're just gonna call it B-A-G-R-N-D. And then I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna save this option. The property name I believe can be used for like uh, reports and things like that. So we're gonna go ahead and save that background check day code and then what i'm going to do is if i go to the employee record we're going to find that there's a date custom field section on the employee records and when i talk about sections i'm talking about like this says identification this says address this says contact this says general well i I don't know where the date fields are at. If I wanted to easily find any occurrence of the word date, I could just use a, so a shortcut, which is my control, my F key, and it pops up this option where I can actually type in something. So I just want to find any occurrence of date. So here you see we have a dates section, and there's all the different dates, birthday, hair day, et cetera. But then we have this employee date CF, which is the employee date custom field. That's where we created that date codes for the background check. And you can see our background check is right here. So I could go in and either enter in or I can choose a date that his background check was done. We'll use today's date. And I'm going to save that record. And then when I've done that, I'm 
Oops, come on here. Right? I could actually go in. Now, let's just say that I wanted to find, mm, let's see. Hernandez, oh, there he is. I didn't use Hernandez, did I? I did, I must not have. Because there's not a date in his field. No, I didn't. I'm gonna go in. All right, let's go in. Well, come on. We'll just run a report anyway. So I'm gonna run a report, but I wanna pull up all the dates. So I could filter. Let's just get add another one and we'll put a 310 date in. Because I want to filter for anything that shows. Uh, let's see, where are we at here? Down here. Find it again. Okay, so I'm going to put in 310. Whoops. Okay. All right, I'm going to save the record. <clears throat> All right, when I do that, crash it. Hopefully, it pulls it up better. Come on. My internet must be tired today. Hmm. There it goes. Okay. Really slow. Sorry about that. You'll notice I'm I'm filtering. I'm using the testing. I'm click on clicking on it. And it sorts ascending and descending. So I'm clicking on it again. That record that I created does not appear to be there. Let me try it again. Maybe I didn't. Maybe it didn't save it. Let me try it one more time. <clears throat> Let's see the record. I might have exited out of exit out of exited out of it too soon. I can't even say that three times fast. Yeah, I did. Okay, let's try it now. Hmm. Why is it not saving now? Anyway, okay. Anyway, you should be able to create date codes put dates in with a, uh, a description, and then you can actually filter on the grid. <clears throat> Come on. Oh, I know why. I know why. I know what I did. All right, where are we here? Yeah, I didn't pull in the I didn't pull in the background check uh, option that I used because that's the date code that I, call, I named it background check, but I only have the testing employee date custom field up. I didn't pull in the background check. So basically now I will see the background check information here. So I want to pull in anybody that has a 3 10 2021 date for my report. Sorry, it's so slow. I'm just really, my computer is really, it's not my computer, it's my internet. And I apologize because usually it's quite quick. 
But I have noticed a lot of times when I go into a Zoom with multiple um, people, it tends to slow it down a little bit. Hmm. Well, it's not filtering very well. All right, let's just do, let's just do a report anyway. I, normally you should be able to filter it, but for some reason things are just very slow. I'm gonna go ahead and again, pull in the Excel field names for this report. And when I do this show report options, if I do that, it's gonna show me how I have this report set up. That'll be like uh, the first page and the second page will actually contain the data. Um, if I wanted to save this report, I could do that. Again, give it a name and save it, then it will go out to the reports uh, option. I'm just gonna go ahead and generate the report so you can see it. I feel bad because I didn't get to really filter what I wanted to filter, but I want you to be able to see that a report can get created. All right. And didn't pull up. Well, I'm not having much luck with this report. Hold on, let me try this again. Let's just try Excel. If that works. Hmm. I did it earlier and it created it just fine. Let me get rid of this. Let's do this. All right. More time. We'll try. This really shouldn't take this long. Let's try PDF format. See what happens here. Ah. <laughs> well, I'm not having any luck with this report. More time. I'm going to try that version again that I use because that worked earlier when I was testing it. No field names. Okay. I apologize for this taking so long. Like I said, I think it's my internet causing the problem with, with the slowness for sure. All right, where'd you go? Here it is, finally. Okay, I'll pull it over here so you can actually see it. Maybe, come on. <laughs> well, I'm trying to drop and drag it and I can't get it to go. Here we go. All right, so here you can see the custom field names, background value, then there's a testing. I had a testing date value that's in there. So you can actually see the dates that you we put in for those date code fields. It's a very slick process when it works, and it works correctly. It's like I said, it's just my system is not cooperating today. All right. Um, the next thing we're going to talk about under the core option are the EMIS entry features. EMIS entry um, only displays records, so they basically can view them or modify them. And a lot of times, uh, districts give access to these, this screen or these screens to their EMIS coordinators because everything available on these, these screens are fields that basically get reported to EMIS that EMIS coordinators may need to make changes to. So that's why they give them access to these records. And you can see we only have the view and the modify access in these screens. And here we have the EMIS employee entry tab. We have an EMIS position entry tab. We have an EMIS contracted service, which are CC records. And then if districts need to create CJ records, contractor records, you'll notice there's no tab for that. That tab can actually be installed and put in so a district has the capability of doing it. 
we didn't include it because there's uh, it's 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 you know a give or take. You may have a lot of districts that need contractor records. We have several that don't. So we basically can just turn that module on by going into system for the modules option. And when you go to the modules option, there's an EMIS contractor module that can be turned on. Which is right here, the EMIS contractor module. You can see right now it's not installed. But if I click the, the plus button to make it a negative, it will then check it and that means it's installed. I can refresh my screen or if I just go back to core EMIS entry, I should now see that uh, C, CJ tab option available in the EMIS entry, which I do. It's right here, the EMIS contractor. So again, the EMIS employees, they can view or make changes to, but I'll just kind of pull up the view option to show you what, what they can actually, what they can actually see. And then what they can actually modify, if I hit the modify tab, you can see there are fields that are grayed out, just the number, the social, and the employee name, they can't change that. But anything else they have a capability of making changes to. Though that's the employee information or the demographic information. Then we have the position entry and the same thing holds true. They can view it or they can modify it. We'll go into the modify tab and you can see what they're able to modify on that record. And the reason they have these is just so uh, the EMIS coordinator, they just have access again to only the EMIS fields that need to be populated in order to pull into the data collector. They don't really need to be able to go into their actual position record or their compensation record. They all need to be able to make changes to specific fields. So you'll see all the different fields that are on here and all the fields that are modifiable. Anything grayed out, they cannot make a change to. Then we have that EMIS contractor CJ record. If they needed to create CJ records, they can go in and do that by just clicking the create option. And when they, when they click create, it'll allow them to uh, put in the employee information or select the employee position, the compensation, the building IRN, the position code and the FTE and save the record. When they have all the CJ records created that they want, they can create an extraction CJ file that they can create the file, save it, and then they can send, well, they can actually, um, upload theirs, you know, if they save it on their computer, they can actually upload that into the data collector then. Or if someone else was adding, entering the data, they would create the file, save it, and then send it to the EIS coordinator. It's however the district processes or what, who they have processing their EIS data. The same thing holds true for the CC records, the contracted service records. They could create contracted service records as needed. They can go back into that contracted tab, contract to service CC tab, and they can click the create option. They could create the record as needed, save it. Once they've saved all the CC records that they need to add, we again have it, this extract CC data tab, which will create the extraction file for them to actually load into EMIS. So they have the capability of adding the records and then creating a file that it can be loaded, uploaded into EMIS. <clears throat> All right, the next option under core is the employee option. The employee option is pretty much, we'll kind of refer back to classic again, it's like the bio screen and the dem screen all combined into one in redesign. So if they were adding a new employee, obviously they would just click this create button and then that will allow them to put in a number. Now, we do have 
um, the, you have the capability, if your district already has numbers being auto assigned, they would not have to put anything in this field. They could just leave it blank because it would auto populate based on that setting that we have set up out there in configuration. So they would put in, say that they, they use auto, auto uh, generate the numbers. We'd skip that, put in the SOJ, the MISID we leave blank, last name, first name. Um, there's very minimal that you have to put on this record in order to create it, but keep in mind, yeah, you could go in and put the social first name, last name in there and save the record, but for new hire and like retirement new hire reports, there's a lot more data that needs to be defined on the record before you actually create the new hire record, because if you don't, there is going to air out. There's going to be problems because like the, uh, the higher date that needs to be defined. The birth date needs to be defined. So there is no validation in here that will tell you, oh, you gotta put a higher date in. Oh, you gotta put the birth date in. There's no validation telling you that. It will allow you just to throw in the social first name, last name and be done. And it will automatically generate the employee ID. But again, if they go, if they want to keep moving forward. Before they do anything with new hires, they have to make sure they get the, the correct data populated for the new hire reporting. You'll notice on this record, we have the save as template option. So if a district wanted to, they could create a template record. And this is test three. And we could go in. And we could maybe do the marital status of single, single female. And maybe this is going to be reportable to EMIS. Let's see, where is that? Let me find that. Here, report to EMIS. Now you'll notice down here, the new hire report to ODGFS, just like in classic, we don't mark it because when we report it to ODGFS, it gets marked automatically. Maybe is this an email direct deposit? Are they reportable to ODGFS? You can populate all of these fields, all this information as a template. Save the template, save the template, the doc, single, yes. We could save that. So the next time we have an employee that's new, that's single and reportable to EMIS and has email director has email direct deposit, we could use that template. We could use that single EMIS email direct deposit template to create that record. That's what those templates are for. And again, if I was creating a new employee, which I use the 333, I added all this information already. I could actually go in and save that. Then that record would be saved as well. Maybe. Oh, <laughs> it's telling me I don't have a first name in there. Well, let me put a first name in there. See if it. Well, all threes cannot be the social security number. There we go. Let's try that. Now, obviously, if I was creating the template record, I probably wouldn't put a social security number in there because if I went back in here, I don't want that all. Let me, let me look here and see if it saved. I mean, it didn't. Yeah, it did. See, it saved those all threes. So when I was creating the template, I should not have put the social security number in there. So I could just go back in and save. This is oops. Save it. And then now we used to hit. Yeah, I I know we have a, a ticket out there to allow us to delete these templates. Right now we don't have it available, but um you could rename it something different to use, but Again, you wouldn't want to use, have a social security number in there for the template record. You would just want that blank. 
that was my bad. So um, on the employee record, let's just go through and see if there's any other fields that need to be. Obviously, we do still have the OSEI code. We have the part-time flag. The eligible for retirement is just like classic. Are they eligible for retirement? Probably not. So that would be left unchecked. The new hire reported OADFS is left unchecked because at this point we have not reported them to OADFS on new hire. Are they reportable to EMIS? If they are, check it. If they are set up, they need to be set up for email and direct deposit, we're going to check that. We want to check the ODJFS reportable because that way when we run a new hire report for all the ODJFS new hires, this person will get included. You'll see this is a new field, spouse's first name. That can be added here if they're married. Uh, the birthday, hire day, the last pay day will populate based on when they were paid. And then uh, the ODJFS hire day, we do need to populate that field. What day were they hired? And the termination date obviously will be left blank unless they actually terminate, unless they actually leave. We do have a uh, last evaluation, next evaluation. Those are just uh, uh, user defined fields that districts can use if they want to. They don't need to, but they can if they want to. We also have the experience fields on the employee record as well, which would be like your um, total years experience, um, authorized years of experience. Those are the reportable ones to EMIS. Then we have those other options available as well. So you could enter in, you know, maybe this person comes in, they have five years of authorized experience and six years of total experience. Put that information in. The race information, you can put that information in. Um, again, we have these user defined codes. For districts, if they want to use them, we actually pulled those right in from Classic. You can use that information um, as well if you want to. Same thing for the standard personnel. We have those fields as well. On um, the state reporting, we have the uh, early childhood education qualification. So what uh, type of degree do they have, bachelor's degree in early education, or maybe they don't have anything for early education. Degree type, obviously, if they're a teacher or, or you know, uh, someone with a, a credential identification, they're going to have a, probably have a degree. The handicap status can just be populated if they so choose. Again, it's not a required field. We have the long-term illness field, just like we have on the um, the. Uh, the employee, the bio screen record in classic. So at the end of the year, when we're doing EMIS attendance, if you have an employee that has to have long term illness days uh, popular or process through EMIS, those would go in here. You would enter those in manually. Other credentials, semester hours, the pay total information all comes from when the employee is paid. If the employee is uh, an employee with a degree, like if they're a teacher or someone that has a certificate, they're going to probably have a credential ID assigned by the state where they got their license. If they're an if they're a non-certified uh, employee, like custodial, they don't have a degree, secretaries, they're going to probably end up getting a ZID assigned to them. And again, this works the same way it does in classic. When you process the, the employee record through the SIF data collector, a ZID should automatically be assigned. You do not have to assign one for them. So when you click save, you'll save that record for the employee. The employee record will then be created. The next option under core is this employee personnel option. And the employee personnel option, again, it only has view and modify capabilities and very few fields that can be modified. Again, you may have an employee that works there that maybe you all, all you want them to do is be able to go in and make address changes or birthday or hire date or you know just something like that. Those are 
the fields that are available for them to make changes to. You can see that here. Maybe you want, want to have them double check all the, uh, um, let me see, I think it's EMIS. Yeah, the report to EMIS flags. Maybe this person is not marked. They should be marked. That person can do that. They can mark that person and then save that record. So those are, those are uh, just certain fields from the employee record that can be uh, modified by an employee with the role to be able to go out and make those changes to the personnel record. All right, get out of here. Our next option under core is the job calendar. The job calendars have already defined. So if you're importing data from your district into the system, they already have job calendars defined. If they needed to, to create a new job calendar for some reason, maybe they have a new teacher and they have a specific job calendar they want them assigned to, they could go in and click this create option to do that. Create a new job calendar. That's what the create is for. Here they could enter in the type, a description, and then they would enter the start dates and end dates of this job calendar. So maybe the start date is 3-1 and the end date is 7-1. Then they have to define what type of days we're going to be adding to these calendars. Work days, holidays, client day, makeup day, none. Obviously, probably work days. We want to include weekend days. Probably not, but you never know. Like if this employee works weekends, we might have to. We could do that. <coughs> Once we've got all of this information defined, you can go in and click this mass add option. When you do that, all of the work days. For the, for the start date and end dates that we enter will be defined. They'll be put in there. And you'll notice here this little, this little grid, <coughs> it actually populated with the number of work days for the fiscal year, the calendar year, the first quarter, the March, and the date range. So like right now, the date range is set for 3 1, 21 to 331. If I went in here, <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me, put in three, one, 21. And let's just say I wanted to go to five, one, 21. It should give me, it should give me the number of days, work days within that custom. Hold on, maybe I got to save this. Let me save it first. Yeah, now it did. I didn't, after I mass added, when you mass add, then you need to save that record. Once you've done both of those things, then you can actually use that grid to sort all the different days if you want to. Where did my test go? There it is, okay. So yeah, once I saved it, then you'll notice that the days for that custom date range that I put in there, it populated. Yeah, now it works. But the, the method should be create at the type, description, the start and end date, the type, uh, at, click mass add, then save. Then if you want to actually look for certain days, you can do that. This custom start and stop date option in this grid is really nice because a lot of districts use it for people that might have left the district and they need to know for like retirement reporting. So maybe they work from beginning of the school year, eight, you know, eight fifteen twenty through today, March 9th. That would actually give them the number of work days that they actually work that they can report for retirement purposes. All right. Um, the next option in job calendar is a mass change option. So let's just say we've had, we've had calamity days. Uh, maybe we had a couple of them at the beginning of March, maybe March 1st or the 2nd, okay? So we could go in and choose the date, March 1st. We wanna change that to a calamity day. And which calendars do we wanna change it for? Do we wanna change it to all of them or just certain ones? If we wanted to change it to the television, we could double click it. 
or you could click on it once and use the right arrow. If you want them all, you could click on the first one, then hold your shift key down, go to the bottom, all of them will highlight, then you can click the right arrow and move them all over. If you wanted to move one back, just double click it, and I'll move them back over to the available option. Once you've gone in and told it, hey, I want to make 3-1 a calamity day, so we'll make ACN, I want to make sure. We're going to save that. So if we go now and look at this ACN calendar, You can see March 1st is now listed as the calamity day. So that's kind of a nice little feature. Another thing to keep in mind too is you have the capability of going into any job calendar that you want to. Let's say that these were marked as work days, this calamity day. Maybe we want to change that. It really should have been a work day. For this, we could actually go in and right click it. And it gives you all the different work options for the type. We could change it to workday. And then once I do that, if my system ever does that, I can save it. Now it's marked as a workday. And so the same thing would hold true like when I was creating that new job calendar. If I was doing that, I could have gone into that. Maybe there were, you know, I, I use 3 1 through 7 1. But maybe there's holidays in between there. I could go back into that calendar and put in my holidays simply by going to the, the, the month that I need to fix or need to change the date to a different uh, type. So I'm going to go in here and let's just say, um, let's say April. We know the Easter is in April. We're going to go to April. And Easter is here, I think. So let's say they're off on Good Friday for holiday, and they're off on Monday for holiday. I can change both of these to holiday and save that record by just right clicking on that day and changing the type to a holiday. And now it saves it. And you'll notice here, it also ended up changing and putting holidays in this grid as well. So it's a really nice little feature. The last option we have is the copy option. And the copy option is going to be used pretty much like, okay, let's just say district at this point, they have their contract for next year, okay, for next school year. They could actually go in, start creating their job calendars for next school year. Not creating, they would create one and then they would copy it. So, but we're not going to create, we're going to mass change. No, sorry, 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 I did that wrong. We're going to create, my bad. <clears throat> Hold on, we're going to modify. I gotta, I gotta give the right verbiage. We're going to modify a calendar because we're not going to create, we don't want to create a new one. We want to modify the existing calendar. So normally they might use their teacher calendar as the calendar, the main calendar. So we're going to go in and we're going to modify that calendar. And let's just say that we're going to start 8, 15, 21 through 6, 30 of 22. We're going to make them all work days. And we're going to mass update that. Oops, hold on. Oh, got the slash. There we go. Try it again. It'll tell you if there's a mistake. Obviously, you can see that if I have to put a slash in there. So it told me, hey, it can't do that. Can't do that. Sorry. And it's thinking, you can see this blue line across the top. It's going right now. And that's because of my internet again. Sorry. I'll go to August of 21, it should show work days. Okay. 
Here we go. Bring you to go. <laughs> it's really slow. There we go. There's September. But you can see the days were added. And again, what I could do then is go in and add, you know, make changes for uh, holidays. All the holidays that need to be added, I could do that. Maybe let's do. Let's do this. There we go. That, that's a little quicker. I don't know when Thanksgiving is, but we'll just put that as a holiday here and holiday here. Then once I've gone in and made all my changes, added all my holidays and maybe days that they don't get paid or you know the whatever, I'm going to save those records. You got to make sure you save. That's the key because if you don't save it everything that you just did is gone. So I saved all those, all the changes I made. Now, since I have um, basically like my template or my master calendar created, I could use this copy feature. And I could copy that AMW calendar that I just created. Eight. 1521 through 630 And again, I can pull in whichever pay group I want to add this calendar to. If I want to add them all, I could click the top one, hit the shift key, go down to the, whoops, I didn't hit the, I didn't hit it. There we go, hit the shift key, go to the bottom, highlight them all, move them all over, and then, oops. Oops, hold on. I don't want to copy it to that. <laughs> I was copying to, to copy. Okay, so I got all these calendars selected. I'm going to go ahead and copy the calendar that I created. All of these other calendars. Then district can go in. Maybe they have a custodial calendar. Maybe they need to tweak it. Maybe they don't have off as many days as you know uh, teachers do. Uh, they work in the summer. Maybe they need to add work days to those custodial calendars. They can do all that, but this helps them so they can at least have a master calendar and then they can just make changes to it. Makes it a lot easier. All right, I'm well, still copying, probably because there's so many. <clears throat> Are there any questions on this? It's, it's, it's pretty basic. It pretty much follows just like what Classic did as far as like the features that are available, the mass copying feature, things like that. And it's just pretty much getting used to a different way of doing it. It's the same method, it's just different ways of doing it. Oh, I shouldn't have chosen all the calendars, it's taking forever. Um, here. I'm doing that. Okay, while that's processing, we might as well go to the leaf screen. So we're going to go to core leaves. Maybe. No, <laughs> we're stuck. Okay, while this is process processing, let me show you a couple things that I was gonna show you at the end today. Um, we do have our documentation out there um, under the wiki, as far as like everything re related to redesign, uh, classic, any of those features. So basically, let me go back one step and I'll show you all the different options that we have. These are all the different documentation areas that we have. We have uh, OACN documentation, USAS web, USPS documentation. That would be for the classic. We have USPS web documentation. We have all the redesign documentation. We got the payroll, we got the USAS, uh, we got the tech, tech, technical documentation. 
our newsletters. There's a link to the newsletters. Um, and if you want, like I said, this is all on our wiki page. So you can go out to that and you can find anything you want as far as documentation. And we try to document everything just to make it easier for the users and the ITC and ourselves. I mean, it's a learning curve when you're going to redesign. It's just, like I said, a lot of the application stuff, like the way you're doing it is similar. It's just that you're, you're applying it differently to redesign. And this thing is still thinking. Okay, so we will now go to this other page. Um, this page is also available on the wiki. It's under our release notes. You know, if you go out to the wiki, go to our release notes. Under that, all the release notes, we have a demo version that ITCs or districts can use to test. So like you could actually go in and run a test and we have some exercises out there under the training um, link that districts or you can go in and use just to kind of play around in the demo version. And this demo version contains kind of limited training data, but you could experiment with the system if you wanted to by adding or changing the data, you know, that's on those exercises that we have available. Um, and keep in mind, uh, the data is reset periodically, just like the test data that I'm using right now, it gets reset like on a certain day of the week. So it may be updated as well. Um, this gives you the username and the password for this demo version. And then you also have the capabil capability as the ITC, um, if you wanted to copy in like your own district's data, you can actually do that. Um, basically, you have to work with MCOECN. I think they have something set up that will allow you to actually go in and do that. Um, if you're wanting to do that, you may need to contact them or talk to them about how to do it if you don't already know how to do that. Okay, let's see. Oh, finally, it finished. Yay! Okay, so if we go back to job calendars, we can see all those job calendars should be out there now with the August through June dates. Let's just go into this first one. I'll just put in 8 Oops. Maybe. There it is. Okay, that's October, but, but yeah, you could see that it did copy them over. And it there was a little message on there telling us how many records got updated as well when we when we copied those calendars over. All right, so now let's go back to leaves. Leaves is uh, equivalent to the benefit screen in classic. So pretty much it's going to contain all the sick personal vacation information. All of that information hinges on whether they're eligible for leave or not. In leaves, you'll notice we have two tabs. We have a leaves tab and the accumulation tab. The leaves tab will show you all the leave for the employees, for every employee. It will give you the employee name, which this person is, here's her personal leave, here's her sick leave. Same thing here. So if they qualify for all three, they're gonna have three records here on the grid. But if you go into modify, let's just say we go into modify, we can actually see all three of the leave, or all two of the leave types or whatever leave type they're qualified for show up on the screen. Now, one thing to keep in mind, um, when you create a new leave record for an employee, you have to make sure that you have a max leave amount in for the sick and a max leave amount should be set up for the vacation. If you don't, it will cause problems as far as like when you're trying to accumulate for the, you know, each month, it will cause it a problem because it's going to say, oh, well, the max has already been met at zero. We're not going to accumulate anymore. So you got to make sure that the districts are aware that those max fields 
or vacation and for sick need to be populated. Now, the other tab is the accumulations tab. So say you have an, a new employee that came in, it came from another school district. They're bringing in 32 sick days, okay? We could go in because your district allows them to pull in, to bring in sick, sick leave, okay? We could go in and add an accumulation record for those 32 days to give her 32 days sick leave on top of what she already had, you know. So in reality, she should get 32. Let's find somebody. Let's find somebody. I'm sure. Okay. Oh, I want to get somebody's sick balance. So you can see when I add 30, I'm going to add 32 days to somebody. And we can see that it actually worked. Go back to leaves. <clears throat> All right, so we'll just go to Jill. So Jill, we're gonna pull in her balance. Oh, here. Uh, right now, let's do, uh, hold on, you got somebody that has zero need for sick. Of course not. Um, let's find somebody that has very minimal sick. Let's do a filter for sick. Might help a little bit. Makes it a little easier to see. And again, you can filter these grids. It makes it really nice because now it's only going to, it should only pull up sick leave, which it didn't. It pulled in some personal. Okay, let's use Jean Hammond. She has 1.75 days. So she'll end up with 33.75 when we do an accumulation. So we're going to go into accumulations. And we're going to add 32 days for Jean Hammond. So I'm going to go ahead and create. Now the position usually populate if it doesn't you can select it from the drop down and then we're going to give her 32 sick days and then you can put a description carry over well, the other district and then we're going to give her 32 days I get it. We have to put a transaction name. I'm going to use 2.8.1 because that's within the posting period I'm currently in. Going to go ahead and save it. Now, for accumulations, I don't think I should have used the March date because I don't believe that the posting period matters much. Well, let's go back in and look at. Here you can see I added the 32 days, but if we go back and look at Jean's leave screen, it should now show the 33 point, let's get a binder here. I filter for her last name, pull her up. You can see she has 33.75 days now, and that's what we wanted. So that's how leaving accumulations work. And so this is a little different than classic because before you were able to add accumulations right in attendance screen, now you do not. You add those in the leaves area or in under the accumulations tab. All right, our next option in the core menu is the organization. The organization, Pretty much is like the dead name record in class, or not dead name. Yeah, no. USP con screen, sorry. I, I went blank there for a minute. It's like the USP con screen in classic. But 
Um, it's all of the district information as far as the district name, their I, I, the, the district IRN, their address, uh, so you say zip, their federal EIN, state EIN, the ODJFS and, and SCRS and STRS codes. And then we also have the STRS advanced configuration. So once they're in advance, it shows the advance amount as well as how much of it has been paid back. All of that information is in here. If for some reason they needed to update, maybe they moved their address, they have, there's an edit capability, they could go in here, change the address, city, state, whatever, whatever needed to be changed, and then just make sure they save it. And then those records will be saved then. <clears throat> the next option under the core is the pay distributions. Pay distributions are like your direct deposit, uh, deduction records in classic, we now call them, they're, they're an actual pay distribution record in redesign. So we're going to go out there and pull up the pay distributions and you'll be able to see that you can go in and add a uh, record, pay distribution records for an employee. Now with, cl with classic, you could only create, they, they could only get either a direct deposit or only a check. They could not get both. In redesign, they can. A lot of districts are choosing not to let the employees know that, but it is a capability and it is an option. So in order to create a pay distribution, you'd have to go into the Create tab. And if it was a new employee, you would find that employee. I'm just going to find Hernandez. He's already in there but I'll find him and maybe I need to add a new, you know, maybe he's got a new um, direct deposit or he wants to partially check or whatever. So we could do that. Here he is, okay. So when we go into gray, we just click uh, find the employee and then click continue. Okay, it's telling me he already has one, which I know that. Okay, if you had a new employee, they wouldn't have a new have one, and you'd have to create a brand new one. So I'm going to go in and click the add pay distribution option. Here it tells me what type do I want to add. Am I adding a direct deposit or a check? If I add a direct deposit, I'm going to click continue. You'll notice that the direct deposit type automatically pulls in. I have to give it a code. Now in classic, we had, they were like 700 codes. You could do that if you want to, or you could say, maybe he direct deposits into a couple banks. So this is a second direct deposit. Now I could put in an abbreviation if I wanted to. Then I have to put in his account number. I have to put in a percentage or a fixed amount. Maybe he wants a fixed amount of $150 put into this account. I could populate the start and stop dates at the start date and stop date if I want to. I don't have to. If I don't, it's going to actually start processing this pay distribution on the next payroll I run. We have a priority, which basically is saying, use this, this one first, then the other one second, and then another one third, or you could just leave that as zero, and it doesn't matter, whatever they want to do. Uh, the direct deposit type, is it, do they do pre-notes, or is it directly going to go into the checking? We're going to do directly go into the checking. Now, these two fields are very important. You've got to make sure they're populated because if they're not, it's going to cause problems when you're trying to process the payroll. The AC destination, remember, that's the bank that the employee is going to get their money sent to. So we're going to select the bank that the money is going to, the routing number in the bank. The ACH source is very important that we have to have that in there because that is basically saying, okay, which like which direct deposit record are we wanting to use when we're processing direct deposits? What do we want to use? 
we want to use that pay ACA transfer. Remember that code 001 that we created for all the header information for that uh, direct deposit tape file? We want to use that. So we got to make sure we populate that. The standard custom fields are district use, whatever, if they want to use them, that's fine. There's codes, dates, money, and then there's a text field. They can use those at their own discretion. When they do, when they have this populated, they're going to click the save option. When I click save, he's now going to have two direct deposit records in there. we will have one, which is set for the fixed rate of 150. The second one is set for the percentage of 100, meaning that after the 150 for this direct deposit, fixed amount is taken out, everything else is going to go to this account. Well, let's just say that he also wants a check. He doesn't want his wife to know he's getting this extra money. So he also wants a check. So we're going to choose the check type and click continue. Here, we can set it up so he gets a check. So again, we could put in a code. So I put in check, whoops. And then a percentage or a fixed amount. I'm going to say it's a fixed amount. He's going to, he wants a hundred dollar check every time he gets paid. Every, and then we could again enter start, stop dates at a priority if we wanted to. Or we do have the custom fields available on the check as well if the district wants to add custom fields and they would save that record. Now we're going to see that he has three paid distribution records. One for the check for a hundred dollars, a fixed amount. Then we've got the second one for the fixed amount of $150. And then the third one, which is the percent that goes to a direct deposit for 100. Now, the thing that the districts have to remember is if they have accounts set up for fixed amounts, they want to have a percentage set up to make sure that any remaining monies that is not accounted for from those fixed accounts goes into that last account. So that's why we have a fix the fix the percent created for this employee. <clears throat> the next option under core is the pay group option. And again, when you're migrating the data from your classic to redesign, all of this should pull in into the pay group area. Um, if they want it, you'll, you'll see this dollar sign. If you see that you have a dollar sign out of your pay groups, it's probably because the importer found maybe like an, a record that was orphaned tied to a pay group, but there was no pay group defined. So it just creates this dollar dollar uh, pay group record out there. But if you needed to create a new pay group, you could just cl click the create option again, and you could go in and create a brand new pay group. And you'll see here we have that create new and close option. I'm going to click the close option this time so you can see what it does when you choose that. So if we want to, we could associate this pay group with the job calendar. I'm going to associate with the first one. Then I'm going to call this code uh, test. And the description is test date. Now you can see we have an archived option. It says I'm creating a brand new one. I'm obviously not going to archive it, but I'm going to show you what is a really nice feature in a minute here. So I'm going to go ahead and save this record, this testing uh, pay group that I'm creating. Notice because I clicked on that close tab, it closed it. It got rid of it. It didn't keep that up there for me to go in and add other pay groups. Now, I wanted to show you that, that cool little feature with the uh, archive. You'll see here, I have this job calendar, DOZ, pay group four, violet six is a description. If I archive that pay group, if I click archive and then click the save option, you are going to see it's gone. It's not in here any longer. The violet six is gone. It's not really gone, so to speak. It's behind the scenes. So if I click this include archive button, 
it's going to pull that back in. That way I can see all the papers, whether they're archived or not. If I don't want to see the archived ones, I just unclick that include archived again. Same thing. And you'll notice on several different screens, we have the include archived option. Well, I think like on employee screen, maybe position screen, I'm not sure. I know there's a couple we don't, but um, you'll notice that we do. So you could include mm -hmm. archive and not include them. The default is not including them, but if you want them, you just go ahead and check it to include them. All right. Um, the next feature under the core menu is the payee field or the payee option, not field, payee option. So the payee option is equivalent to a part of the dead name record that was in classic, not all the dead name part of it. And what this means is you're setting up a payee record to apply to a, a, a payroll item configuration. You're gonna uh, you're gonna put the payee with the payroll item configuration record. So the first half of the dead name is this. It's the payee. So if I go in and click the create option here, I could go in. You'll see again. I have these create new close options available to me. I could create a new payee by just typing in the information needed. Uh, the, I'm going to tell it whether this is an electronic payment or not. The address. And then if it's a foreign address, you can put in the provenance and the country. If you want to put a phone number, a fax number. If it's unlisted phone number, you check that. If it's unlisted fax number, you can check that. Um, you can also archive payees, just like we talked about in pay groups. Obviously, since we're creating a new one, we're not going to archive it. I'm going to click this Create New tab. And then when I click the Save, it should pop that box up again so I could create another one if I needed to. I'm going to go ahead and cancel and just get out of there. But that record is now created for my, the test record is created, the payee record. Now, if I wanted to go in and you know, if I wanted to archive a record, I could do that just like we did in PAE. I'm going to archive this Cognell signs. So I click the archive, click the save button. Now you'll notice it's gone. Cognell signs is gone. But if I click the include archive, it's going to add it back in. It'll include it. I'm going to go back and unarchive that real quick and save the changes that I made. I'm going to close. Okay, so that's basically the payee. That's half of the dead name marketing classic. The other half, we're going to skip a couple things here, is the payroll item configuration. So this is basically the information regarding the, the payroll item the employee is paying into. So if I go to create a payroll item, first I have to choose the type of item I'm creating. I'm just going to create an annuity. And again, those uh, already defined codes like 001, 002, 692, 693. Those are already defined out there. You cannot use those. You cannot use those to set up new, new uh, payroll items. So I'm just going to create a new payroll item. And test here, test for W2 abbreviation. And then we're going to choose the payment cycle. This is for when this payroll item is paid. Is it paid every payroll, monthly, quarterly? We'll say every payroll. The annuity type, I'm just going to say it's a section 125, non wages. If it was a board annuity, board, um, board uh, payroll item, we could put in the object codes. 
that need to be defined when we're, we're processing employer distributions or like more distribution, we could define those object codes here. We also have options like to suppress the SSN ID. That would suppress it from the report when we process the reports and when we're doing payroll. Uh, is this employer health coverage? Just like in classic, we have those that feel if it's an employer health coverage uh, deduction, we have to mark it. Do we want to print the employer amount on the sub? The show, a cre show on Create Wizard, that is not currently available yet. Is this required? So when we're adding a new employee, do we want to see this? Do they have to have this record? Yes or no? Is it voluntary? We could just check the voluntary. Now down here is the important thing, payee. That's what we created. Remember we were in, in payee and I created that test payee? Well, I can find my, that record that I created by typing in a few words or a few letters of what I'm trying to find. And it should give me all occurrences of that. Well, here it is. It's this test, one, two, three, yes, E. I was supposed to be test. Must have typed it wrong. And I'm going to go ahead now and save this record because I, I have the, oh, shoot, I already have a 566 deduction code. Let's try 596. Let's just see if we have one of those. We don't. Okay, so I created a payroll item configuration record for an annuity, a 596 record. All right. So that's your dead name record, half and half, payee and payroll item configuration. Now let's kind of skip back to the payroll accounts. These are going to be the employee accounts, pay accounts that they're going to be paid out of, okay? So if you have a new employee, you're going to be going in and creating a new account for that employee by hitting create. You have to find that new employee that you added, the position that you're adding the pay account for, and then you continue. Now, I already have a record for Harry Hernandez, and it tells me that, okay? So what I can do, it pulled up the record that I already have for him, but if he was a new employee, you would be getting a blank screen to add the, the, the expenditure account. So if I wanted to add a new, new account from this employee, I would click this add button. And then it gives me a blank line where I can add the payroll account information. So if I know the account, the expenditure account that's out in use as, oops, I, I must have created two. Let me get rid of this one, right? Just clicking this X. And then I'm just gonna say, yeah, I wanted to delete that record. Emma. Okay, so now if I know the account, I could just start typing in a little, a few of the characters. Let's do 32. And then it starts filtering those. The more dimensions I put in, it starts filtering. Oops, I didn't do that right. So then I could easily go in and choose which account he's to be paid out of. Then I can specify if the status of the account, if it's active, if it's a specific miscellaneous account, I could add that. And then I could put in, is it a percentage or a fixed amount? I'm gonna say it's a fixed amount. Maybe I have a hundred dollars. Stop. I'm gonna go back and do an active and just do a fixed amount hundred dollars. Now you'll notice we do have a capability of adding a max. So maybe maybe this employee gets paid out of a grant account and there's a maximum of like uh, two thousand two thousand dollars that gets charged to this account. I could set that, and then also we have to go in. We could put a start date and stop date if we wanted to. We don't have to, those are optional. But then here we have an employer distribution 
and a leap rejection option, you have to check if this, if this account is subject to employer distribution and if it's subject to leap rejection. Once you do that, you save that record. And then what happens is when you save that, since this is a max, every time it's paid, that remaining max will get populated showing how much it has left to, to pay out of the account. It'll show that information. So that's if you're adding a new employee. Um, again, you could add multiple, it's just like classic. You may add like several active records, maybe three fixed ones for uh, $100 here, $100 there, and then one record for a percentage of 100 to pick up everything else that needs to go to the, to, to the last account. Okay. Um, let's see. We already talked about that. Laura, yes. Yes. I have a couple of questions. Sure. Um, on the payroll account. Yes. Is there a way of using the X refs? Um, I'm thinking. I, I want to say yes, but let me double check that. So X reps, the accounts. I will double check that and and make sure. I'll, I could let you guys know. Are you are you going to be here tomorrow? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I will let you know. If and I, I also have one district. Okay, and I have a district that I just brought in in the last couple of days that has a lot of missing payroll accounts. They got paid on the old, on this other account, and then they overwrote that account, pay account. And so I have a lot of missing pay accounts. Is that okay? They're on old checks. You mean you paid them in redesign and they were paid out of a, a different, a wrong account? Is that what you're saying? No. Um, actually, no, the, I'm, I'm bringing them in for legacy. Uh huh. Okay. I'm bringing them in from legacy and the import is showing me a lot of missing, no pay accounts. Okay. Is it from like current oh, I are these records? Are they current? Like are they are they from like no. way back? Are they archived? Are they are maybe orphan records or no? Um they're old checks, like maybe from 2018. Oh. Well, if you're pulling in that like, and they were paid on one account and I'm wondering I'm are those put a help desk ticket in. Yeah, put a help desk ticket in and we'll take a look at it because we're probably going to have to pull the files from the district in order to be able to better try to figure out what exactly is happening. That might be your best bet. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh -huh. okay. Um, the next <laughs> stop. Hold on one second, everybody. I'm gonna let me dog out. Hold on. <laughs> Okay, one of the, the downfalls from working from home. <laughs> okay, um, the next core item we're gonna talk about are the payroll items. Now the payroll items basically are like your deduction screens and classic, which like are your federal, state, annuities, regulars, Medicare. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about Medicare because in redesign, Medicare is done a little bit differently than in classic. And what that means is basically, in classic, if you have a Medicare pickup, you normally have a 692 and a 694 or 693, 695 record. In redesign, we do not have that. In redesign, everything is on 
one record. It's either on the 692 or 693, whichever one they use for Medicare. So with that being said, if they have Medicare pickup by the board on the Medicare record, and I will go in and show you a Medicare record at 692, what the district has to do is put the entire 2.9% that needs to be withheld in the employer rate. So what it would look like is the rate, which is the employee is blank, and the employer would show two, whoops, 2.9. Oh, I can't type 2.9, we go. And then I would say that record. So basically that means that he has Medicare pickup. And like I said, it's a little different than classic and you just have to make sure that if you have pick up employees for Medicare, that they get, they get pulled in correctly. They get pulled in that way, that, that it shows employer rate at 2.9%. Because we no longer have those 694, 695 records that have to be associated with the other records. <clears throat> so again, if uh, you have a new employee you would go in and click the create option. You're gonna find that employee and then you would find the payroll item you wanted to add. So let's just say the 001 record. Actually, let me do this. If I type in 001, that's federal, or I could type in the word federal. Whoops, hold on here, I don't wanna do that. Let me just, let me just, let me, let me get an annuity record here. I'm going to add that new record that I created to Hernandez. So let's just go in. If I can get him to pull up, there we go. So that was 596, I think. Yeah, we're going to add that record. And then you'll see there was a there was position listed on there. That position is for any annuity or any not annuity, any record, any. Uh, deduction record that can be applied only to positions like your like a classic like you have Medicare that may be set up by position retirement by position maybe city record by position if that's the case like if I would have gone in here and chose uh, 692 being that I was choosing an item that can be defined by a position it should let me pull it back up. It should allow me to enter a position if I want to. See, like when I added that annuity record, you'll notice that position option was gone. The position option is only available in cert for certain payroll items. And when those payroll items are added, that position option is there. If you, need, if you want to add it by position, you don't have to unless you have like, maybe you have a superintendent who has Medicare pickup for only a superintendent job, but then he has, uh, he coaches football. That, that position is not Medicare pickup. Well, you'd have to have two separate records. You would have um, a position one for a superintendent for the 692 with the 2.9%, which is your Medicare pickup. But then you would have another Medicare record with no position defined, or you could define position two, the football coach, and then that would not be using the 2.9%. The employee would pay his portion, the board would pay their portion. So just keep that in mind that that's kind of how that works. <clears throat> now go back in and use this annuity again. I'm gonna add this for the, this employee. So I go ahead and click the continue button. When I do that, it should pull up that record. Now, as you can see, I could create a template record for this if I wanted to. So it's already set as an annuity because I created that in the payroll item configuration. The rate type, maybe this um, has a, a fixed amount of $100, this annuity. And I have to choose my pay cycle. I'm gonna go ahead and split it. And if there's an employer rate, you could add that here as well. If there's an account number associated with this account, you can enter that information in. Although right now, 
if there's an account number entered, I don't believe that when we run the payroll reports uh, that it's included. I know that we have a ticket out there to do that, but it's not done right now. If we wanted to start and stop date, we could add that. Now, if this annuity has a max, so maybe he could only pay up to $2,000, we're going to set a max up right down here where it says employee max withholding. Now we have to set a deduct, deduct max type, which is, is it going to start and start in, in process annual on an annual basis, a fiscal year basis, or do we want it to start with using a specific date? If I use specific date, I have to enter in a specific date that I want this to start. I'm gonna put three one. I can use the calendar or I can type it in either way. And then I have to choose or put in that max amount. I'm going to put in $2,000. If you also had an employer rate listed here, I'll put in employer rate as well. You had the capability of adding an employer max withholding as well. You could set this up the same way with the deduct max type, how you want it to process annually, fiscal dates, or specific date. I'll use a specific date again. And then the max amount for the board is $4,000. Once I have all that entered, I'm gonna go ahead and save the record. That's saved for that employee, okay? Now, I didn't save it as a template. Maybe, maybe because the maxes are different for employees, I could go in and create a template record using my all ones. Oops. A little slow on the draw here. And then my six. Continue. Oh, come on. And then I could create a template record like. I want to be able to use this record, you know, if other, if other people have this annuity, I want to be able to, to save this. Maybe they got, maybe they have $100 withheld. Split, and then there's an employer rate of 200. Uh, maybe there's a max, but we aren't going to populate anything because the max is based on a person by person basis. We would just leave all that blank, but we could save this as a template so we'll just do, um, we could do annuity 100, 200 and save it. Then I could go back in here and do 200, 400, and I could save that template. Two hundred, four hundred. Save that, and then the next time when I'm adding a, a new employee, this is really, really helpful for your health insurance or your dental and vision. You could, you know, have single or family coverage. You could have templates for that. Then it's easy just to go in to the, the templates and choose which template you want to use when you're creating a new employee. Super nice, but all of those templates that you save are going to be saved out there. You know what, I just noticed something. Let me go back in here. I noticed, well, I thought I noticed the uh, X's, which allowed you Let's see, hopefully he doesn't have this one, he probably does. Yeah, he does. Um, okay. I wanted to see, I wanted to see, I thought those templates showed X's when I was in. Let me go back in. Let me let me try Jill. We'll add that new one to Jill Garza. I'll show you how the template's gonna work when I add her, Jill.
Nope, it didn't. I thought it did. So anyway, I had a 596 record for Jill Garza, and she is on the annuity for the 200 400. I could select that. It populates all that information for me already. Then all I have to do is just save her, save the record. Or if I wanted to add a max, I could do that. The deduct max information, the max amount, and the specific date if I chose specific date, and then I save that record. So that's a really nice thing with the templates. You can really use those for multiple things. You can use them, you know, it's, it's, they're created and designed to help the user, to make it easier for the user. Okay, um, let's see where we're at here. Position. All right, a, the position record is basically like the uh, dead name record. Oh, hold it, not dead name, where am I at here? Job screen, oh geez. The job screen, position screen, and pay screen kind of all wrapped into one. There's, it's kind of like multiple screens all added together. So if you were creating a position, you would click the create option, find your new employee. And then click continue. And then it'll bring up a blank screen for you. Now, this is the same as when we were adding new employee. There are certain fields that are required but not everything has to be added. Not everything is validated. So, I mean, you could add what is required and save the record. But again, you wanna make sure you have everything populated, populated before you try to create your new hire reports. So we're gonna put in a uh, position 10 and a description of 2021 test. We're gonna say the job status is active. It can be inactive, deceased, or terminated. We have to, we want to select a pay group. This one, the appointment type, these classified. The building code, we'll choose that. A department code, we can choose that. Yeah, the FTE, the hire date, when was he hired? Is this a supplemental position? When is he starting this position? We don't need to put a stop date because really we don't know when he's going to stop. The raise date would get populated if he gets a raise through new contract. Uh, we have to populate what type of retirement he is qualified for. SERS, STRS, or none. We're going to say SERS. We have a termination date field. Again, only populated if he left. Who his supervisor is. There's a drop down that will give you all that information. And again, you could type in a few letters of the of the name of the supervisor and it will pull up or you could just use a drop down select it and it'll, it'll populate that field we have an archive again since i'm adding a new i'm not going to archive the record here's the eligibility flag for leave are they eligible for personal sick vacation leave on this position we have a paraprofessional hire date we have funding source codes. Is it local funds, federal funds? How are they funded? The percentage, put on 100. If, there's a, if they're teachers, they may probably have an assignment area. Is this job reportable to EMIS? You'll see here we have a staff employment section. This section basically will be helpful if you have an employee that has a district that has an employee who has maybe multiple jobs. They work at the high school and the middle school and the elementary school. You only, you only want to pay them on one of, just pay them out of one position. You could do that, but just have the other positions set up with the correct FTE. What you could do is on the, the one position, you could define all of the information as far as the pay, the contract work days, the hours in the day, just like we do on the classic side of the EMIS info field, you can use that information on this screen in these fields here. And if you do that, this information will pull in from with the data collector. It'll ignore like the compensation record and it will pull the data from this field from the staff employment. So again, you could you know select the position code. Uh, 
position type? Is it a regular, uh, supplemental, or temporary? The status of the position is probably going to be contract, active, continuing employee. The FTE or special ed FTE if they're if they're in the education field. If they're in the education field, teacher low grade and high grade have to be honored. If they're leaving, separation reason, they're professional. Uh, the contract amount, contract work days. Again, these fields here are only going to be used for EMIS reporting. If you're not wanting to use these, you could leave these blank. Um, there's a building IRN. You can enter that information in. Extended service is normally only for ESCs. And then we have the custom standard uh, payroll field that can be used by the district for anything they want to put in these fields. And I'm just going to save this record. Again, see how we have save as template? You can create template records. You could have template records for EMIS reportables, not reportables. You could have template records for married, not reportable. I mean, you could go on and on. Reportable to EMIS. The, the templates is endless. You could create multiple templates if you wanted to. <clears throat> so that's how you would create the position record. And again, any of these screens, you can filter you know, certain data. Whatever's, on the, whatever's available for grid options, you can filter it. And then you can run reports on it if you want to. That's a very nice feature that we have now in the redesign. This also has the mass change. This is very helpful. You can make mass changes. Maybe you want to mass change a, a stop date. You know, you would pull the stop date up on the grid that you're wanting to change. And you'd be able to go in and make a mass change to a stop date. You can definitely do that. Um, we'll go back. I'm trying to think. Something that, that's really good for mass changing is the payroll items. Because payroll items, a lot of times, like at the beginning of January, you might have to change payroll like rates, like health insurance rates or city tax rates or something like that. We could go in, maybe we want to change the city tax rate to the 003 record. We could do that by filtering the code 003. So we should get, I'm going to put equal 003 because I only want 003 records. And that's what I got, all 003 records. Now, I want to go in, the current rate says 2.5%. Well, they changed it to 2.0%. So I'm going to go into Mass Change, click the Mass Change tab. Now, we already have some definitions created under this low definition for changing rate. So I'm going to go ahead and click that Change Rate option. When I do that, it gives me the script, script parameters that I can go actually go in now and change the default value. I want to change that to 2.0%. So once I've got my new rate entered in here, I can go in. Where is it? Oh, I got to click the execution mode. I was looking for something ahead of time. Once I click execution, I could have entered a new rate here as well. I did it in the script parameter, but if I left that script parameter blank, it would have just been blank and I could have put the rate here of 2.0. But now that I have that set, it's telling me that it's gonna change 304 payroll items. And the thing is the district, if they do this, have to be extremely careful that they have it filtered accurately because they could change things that they don't wanna change. Um, I'm going to go ahead now and do the submit mass change option. When I do that, it should change the 2.5% rate to the 2.0% rate. It might take a little bit because, like I said, my, my internet is a little bit behind today for some reason. Yep, it's, it's working. I can see it, the blue dot line going across. Okay, look up here. And it told me 304 items will be cha were changed. But now if I close this, look at the rate. It changed all of them to 2%, which is what I wanted to do. Like I said, this is really going to be beneficial 
or changing annuity rates, regular rates, maybe oopsie do rates. Um, really, really helpful if they can use that for mass changing those payroll items. And that's one of the main uh, features that they use payroll items for the mass change option in, in payroll items is changing rates. <clears throat> All right. Uh, we have a position uh, personnel. It's the same as the employee personnel. And what that means is whoever has the role to be able to go to this position personnel, they can only view or modify the position information that's defined on the screen. They, have, they cannot change anything on the position record itself, only the position personnel record they have access to where they can make changes. And last but not least in CORE, we have the posting periods. And the posting periods, again, you saw up in the right-hand corner, my posting period currently is set to February. I'm gonna change that. I want it to be set to March because that's the next posting period I should be in. I'm finished with all my monthly uh, processing for February. So I can go in here and click the create option and choose my month, which is March, choose the year. Now, I, if I want March to be my current posing period, I can mark current for the current posing period. Now, if let's just say that your district still had February open and they, were, they wanted to add future information for their next payroll, for March payroll, they could do that. They could enter that information without having to worry about the posing period being set. They could click the create option. The thing about the current period is you have to be in current before you actually can completely process the payroll through. You have to be in that, in that month as current before you can completely, can completely process the payroll through. And I'm gonna show you once it comes back up here. Okay, so now you can see um, these little folder here things here tell you whether it's <clears throat> open and correct currently February and March are open. If I'm finished with February, I really need to close February. I need to have it closed. I can always reopen it if I want to. And one thing to keep in mind, any posting period that you um, process payroll or uh, created in redesign, you can reopen. If you imported posting periods from classic, you'll notice these right here. They're here, but they're all grayed out. You, you do not have the capability of uh, reopening them. But here, I created the February posting period in the redesign. I have the capability now of, of closing it, which I wanna do because over here, this is what I always look at instead of these, these folders, <laughs> these flags, because, oh, come on, I click on it. I wanna basically close this February. I already made the current false when I chose current for March. You notice that was true. Now, February shows current false and open false. And you notice that my folder went over here as it's, it's kind of, uh, opposites. If I want to open it back up, I click this and it would change that to true. It would open it back up. But I want to make sure when I'm finished with a month, I close the posting period. Again, I can always go back and open it, but I want to close it when I've completed that month. So now we can see that March is open and it is current. That, that's, the, that's the way the status of this posting period. All right, one final thing I'm going to show you before we're finished for today is the employee dashboard. And what we call the employee dashboard is kind of like the browse screen in classic where you could go in and you could see uh, pay information or you could go in and add a new employee, you know, uh, screen by screen. You could do the same thing here. So. Let me first of all go back in. I'm just going to go in and create a new employee. 
Okay, I'm just going to create a new employee because anytime you want to use the dashboard, you have to have a, an employee created. So I'll just go in and add the bare minimum to get an employee created. <clears throat> All right, I'm just going to save that record. Now, what I can do is, like I said, just like in classic in browse screen, instead of having to go to core to add all the required screens, because sometimes it's hard to remember like which screens you need to create, I could go in, we call the dashboard, which is right here, this, this plank area. I'm my employee. Currently, defaulted employees cannot be found on the dashboard either, just so you know. All right, so I'm going to go in, and here's my new employee that I had created. All right, if I go up here, I can edit the employee information from here, from the, from the dashboard. And we are going to have employee photos available eventually. Um, there's some issues with loading them. I know we've had district report that they've loaded pictures and the picture on the screen is not the person that is listed. So we have uh, uh, issues with that. We're going to try to get that fixed. So now what really makes it nice, instead of, like I said, having to go to core, okay, let's see, I got to go to core. I got to create the employee. I got to create the position. I got to create the compensation. I got to remember all this. You don't have to. Go to the dashboard. Once you've got that employee created here, are all the, the screens that need to be created. Well, basically almost all of them. Position needs to be created. So you go in, you click on position. It should pull up. <clears throat> Maybe it's being a little slow. And I could go in here and I could create a position record for, him, for this, for Luke. So I'll just go in and create a real quick record. Uh, okay, one. Oh, one. And I make sure I get the selected job status. Pay group. Just select the pay group. I'll leave the building code and stuff empty for now. Let's do one. CRS. Supervisor in for him. I'm just going to save this record. All right, so the position record has been created. Oh, and one thing I forgot to choose. I forgot to go in and select the eligibility flag because I wanted to do that. I'm the teacher, we'll do 230. Okay, we'll save this. All right, then we're going to have to go in. Once we've done that, we have them go to the compensation record. And it's really nice because it just kind of flows. It's just, it's a uh, flows through. We're adding a new record and it already pulls up. You know, the position one is out there. The compensation type I'm going to create as a contract. So I'm just going to go in and continue that. Got to create his compensation so he gets paid. And start date is ran we'll this and five. You can see I'm just kind of going out and make don't yeah, don't look at this. Something happened with our anonymizer and someone pointed this out. And we didn't know it, didn't notice it at all till 
someone pointed it out, but yeah, that shouldn't have been there. Um, I'll go ahead and put in a contract amount for him, an obligation, and we'll do number of pays. We're making a stretch paid employee. I'm not going to override the paper period or the unit. I just want the system to calculate it out. Oh, boy, well, he's going to get paid a lot. Holy cow. What is wrong here? Hold on. Something's wrong. <laughs> Let me override this. I don't know why it did that, but it's probably because of the, oh, the work days. You only got one. Yeah, that calendar must only have one work day on it. Well, let's see if I can find a different calendar. But I thought that, that was the one that we used for the other guy. Hmm. All right. So I saved his compensation record. Then we have the leaves. Again, you have to create a leaves record for the new employee. Go in and choose leaves, create the leaves records. Um, you would put in your cum per month unit, whether it's daily or hourly, and then I, you have to put in a max. Same thing for your personal, you would do daily, three, and reset by this three, and then your vacation, daily, and you have to have a max of 20. I'm going to save this record. Now, the only bad thing here with the leaves, if let's just say we need to give him a balance of three personal days, the accumulation option is not available under the dashboard, which means you have to go back out to the core leaves and the accumulation in order to give him the three personal days accumulation. So let me go back. Oops, hold on here. Accumulation will give him his three days for personal. Eight. Okay. Now we should be able to go back into the dashboard and he should have three days of personal leave as his balance. You can see it up here on the dashboard itself. It says personal leave three. You can see that as well up here. And this is really nice too because when he's paid, every time he's paid, the year to date gross it gets updated, the applicable gross gets updated, and the net gets updated as well. And the leave, it, it also gets updated if leave is used or in, if it's uh, accrued. The payments is basically like browse screen when you're looking at checks. Obviously, there's nothing there because he's never been paid. When he gets paid, will we actually be able to see a payment? And you actually go into that payment and look at it. Then we have attendance. If I was going to... Um, mainly add an absence or attendance information in. I could do it here as well as from core attendance if I wanted to. I need to add payroll items for the employee. So I could go in here and do a create. We'll just add the basics. We'll do the federal. I don't know, we might have a template we do. Although the tap button didn't have a tax table set up. Go ahead and save that. All right, and we'll do the state. If there was an OSDI code involved, we could have entered that in the state record as well. If we needed to, we could have done that. 
Um, let's go ahead and create the, the uh, retirement records. Now you'll see when I choose the 450, it'll, it would allow me to choose a position if I wanted to, but you don't have to. It's only required if you're doing it for withholding my position. And we have a note there now telling you that because we had a lot of people that were actually going in and choosing the position. They don't really need to do that. Okay, so we fire rate of forty percent employee. Yeah, not none of this applies. It's not a rehiree. Just save that. And again, that's where the templates really come into play because you don't have to go in and check all these boxes and make sure. Actually, I probably should have put full time. Save that. And then I'll go in and create the 591 and the Medicare. And those will be the only ones I create for that. And again, this 591 will have the position available as well. So I'm going to go put in percent and 14%. Oops. And everything else is populated already. And then I'll add my Medicare record. And then we'll go on to pay accounts. Again, I could select a position if I really needed to. Don't really need to though, because he's only got one position. And I have that information, save that record. All right. So the deductions are created. I got the deductions set up for this employee. The last uh, option in, in employee dashboard is your payroll accounts. So we obviously have to set up pay accounts for him to get paid because if you don't, when you go to run the payroll, you would get an error. So we're going to go ahead and choose the position that we're adding the payroll accounts for. And I'm going to click the add option because I want to add a payroll account. I could add multiple. I'm just going to add one for now. So let's just do a one. Oops, one. Uh, two. And let's see if we really here. Let's just do this one. Okay. I choose the account, the status of the account. If it's a max of charge, I have to specify that. I didn't do that earlier when I showed you that. It was my bad. But this isn't a max. We're just going to set it up as active. Percent, 100%, no maximum. We got to make sure if it's uh, employer, if it's subject to employer distribution and leap production, got to make sure we define that. If we have any certain sort order for these accounts, we could put those in as well. One. Maybe I'll go in and add a second account. Maybe I'll do this account. And then we'll make that one a max. That's going to be a fixed amount of, let's see. And then maybe this account is not subject to employer retire or distribution and I'll leave projection. So I'm going to save that. Yeah. Now I've got two accounts set up for him. One of them is a fixed uh, $175 with a max of $2,000 and then a percentage of 100 Now this, again, this max account, when it's paid each time, it will reduce by $175 until it's totally expended. Then it will no longer charge that account. Okay, I think that's everything for today. I know I went over a little bit. I apologize for that. Um, are there any questions on what we covered today? And I will look, uh, check into that XREF option that you asked about for pay accounts. I'm almost thinking it's the answer is no, but I will double check on that to make sure. Anybody have any other questions for today? Okay, 
I will see everybody back here tomorrow morning at nine o'clock. Have a great day.